Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, for our event today, hosted by the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings on America and Afghanistan, one year after the withdrawal. I am Madhya Afsal. I'm a fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, um, part of the Center for Middle East Policy, uh, and I'm delighted to have an expert panel um, uh, with two of my colleagues, as well as uh, journalist Wes Morgan, uh, all experts on Afghanistan, uh, to discuss uh, this important topic uh, on a, a set of important anniversaries. Um, so yesterday marked 21 years since the September 11th attacks. Um, before that, August 30th uh, marked one year since the US withdrawal from Afghanistan after 20 years of war and presence uh, in, in Afghanistan. And before that, August 15th marked one year since the Taliban takeover of the country. Uh, that coincided, of course, with the collapse of the Afghan army and the Afghan government um, that uh, had been backed by the, by the US. And of course, uh, there has been so much attention and there was so much attention last year in August uh, focused on uh, the chaotic nature of the withdrawal, um, the scenes in particular, unforgettable scenes uh, at the Kabul airport on Afghan allies that we could not get out in time and we'll discuss all of that. Um, but I think in that we sort of have not always gone back to the bigger picture, um, which is that the US defeated the Taliban in 2001, um, yet the 20 year presence in Afghanistan ended with the Taliban back in power uh, in 2021. What does that mean for the country? What does that mean for the region? What does that mean for the US? Uh, what does that mean about the 20 years of the war and the presence um, in Afghanistan? Um, and as I said, here to discuss um, all of this, I ha have uh, uh, an expert panel, all three of whom have written extensively on Afghanistan over the years. Start off with my colleague, Bruce Rydell, who's a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program, also at the Center for Middle East Policy. Bruce had a long career in the US government. He chaired the strategic review of US strategy towards Afghanistan and Pakistan at the beginning of the Obama administration. Uh, Bruce is the author of many books, including What We Won, America's Secret War uh, in Afghanistan, which focuses on the, the Soviet-Afghan war um, uh, in, the, in the 1980s. Uh, I have my colleague Vanda Felbad brown here. Vanda is a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program and the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors. She has done extensive fieldwork in Afghanistan over the years and is the author of multiple books, including Aspiration and Ambivalence, The Strategies and Realities of Counterinsurgency and State Building in Afghanistan. And, and finally, last but not least, uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Wesley Morgan. Wes is a journalist and the author of The Hardest Place, The American Military Adrift in Afghanistan's Pesh Valley, a book that came out uh, last year uh, in March uh, 2021, uh, just before President Biden announced um, uh, sort of the final withdrawal of US troops. And Wes wrote that book as an embedded reporter uh, in the Pesh Valley right after the surge uh, that began uh, under President Obama. Um, so just, you know, I wanted to start off uh, with uh, a retrospective on, on the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wanted to mention some of the, the costs of the war. And, and some of the gains of the war. Uh, but the costs are, of course, astronomical. Uh, so this is the costs of war project uh, uh, from Brown University that estimated uh, that the US spent uh, more than $2.3 trillion on the war um, over 20 years. Uh, and of course, there are costs of war in terms of lives lost. Um, so of US military personnel, uh, more than 2,300. U.S. contractors, more than uh, 3,900. Of Afghan national military and police, more than 69,000. Um, of Afghan civilians, more than 46,000. Um, of course, uh, there was a, an insurgency that began in Pakistan during the time of the war and the 
uh, the uh, a group allied with the Afghan Taliban, the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, killed tens of thousands of Pakistanis over the border. So these are huge costs. At the same time, there were counterterrorism gains uh, that were made. The U.S. largely decimated Al Qaeda. Um, yet, Ayman Al Zawahiri was found and killed uh, in Taliban-run Kabul just last month. So. Uh, sort of with that in mind, um, I, I want to turn um, to Bruce. Uh, and Bruce, if you could just start us off um, reflecting on sort of the 20-year arc of the war, in particular with your vantage point uh, in the U.S. government during part of that time. Um, uh, you know, uh, and as I said, you, you chaired the strategic review at the beginning of the, the Obama administration. Given now, what we know now about about how it ended, but how you looked at it over the time as well. Over to you. Um, I was in the White House on the morning of September 11th, um, was immediately uh, evacuated out of the building. The uh, decision to intervene in Afghanistan made by the Bush administration was really a no brainer. Uh, we had very, very good intelligence that more Al-Qaeda attacks were being planned in Afghanistan, and in some cases were in the final stages of preparation, uh, including an attack uh, similar to 9-11 to be launched against the West Coast of the United States. So we had to react, we had to react quickly. Unfortunately, the American military had no plan for what to do about Afghanistan, literally. The only plan we had was a CIA plan to intervene on behalf of the Northern Alliance, which is what in the end the Bush administration did. Um, if you didn't read yesterday's Washington Post, uh, it had an absolutely excellent article about the CIA officer who led the intervention, Gary Schroen, uh, and the difficulties we had. In short, we didn't have enough troops on the ground. And as a consequence, uh, the Al-Qaeda leadership and the Taliban leadership were all able to flee into Pakistan. Uh, we also had no plan for what to build after taking over Kabul. All of that had to be kind of invented on the ground, uh, primarily at the Bonn conference, um, where one of the most active players was ironically the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, with ideas on how to, how to build a new uh, Afghanistan. Of course, in 2002 and 2003, we took our eye off the ball and expertise and experience left Afghanistan and started to work on Iraq. Uh, literally every Arabic fluent case officer that had been involved in the Afghan operation was shunted off to work on Iraq. The consequence was that at the critical moment when we needed to build an Afghan government uh, that was capable of, of working, um, we weren't doing it and we weren't giving it the resources. Uh, that was a, a self-imposed but absolutely critical mistake. Uh, by the time Obama came into office in 2009, there were two realities. Al-Qaeda had uh, recovered, was rebuilt, and was planning new operations, um, straddling the Afghan-Pakistan border. Um, and the Taliban were winning the insurgency. By every statistical measure, the Taliban were winning the insurgency. Obama, um, who had campaigned on Afghanistan as, quote, the good war, um, was very conflicted about what to do about Afghanistan. Uh, his vice president, of course, uh, argued at the time for a very limited counterterrorism approach, uh, actually uh, a, a downpourment of American troops that was almost exactly what he inherited from the Trump administration. Uh, Obama, after several studies, uh, concluded two things. One, he was going to let the CIA drone operations against Al Qaeda uh, go completely uh, as intense as possible. And second, that we would fight an insurgency against the Taliban and bring in more troops. Um, the first strategy worked well. Uh, as you mentioned, Medea, by 2011, 2012, Al-Qaeda was decimated. Uh, not everyone was killed, obviously, but the leadership was very much decimated. 
Um, the open question today is, of course, uh, can it recover in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, now that the Taliban are back in office? Uh, I fear that that is a real likely possibility. Uh, the second strategy of counterinsurgency against the Taliban uh, never got full support, uh, was always time bound, um, and certainly did not get any support uh, from the Trump administration when it came in, uh, which um, embarked upon a negotiations process with the Taliban, in which I have to say, um, the Taliban as negotiators outnegotiated the Americans on virtually every single point, uh, leaving the, Ob the Biden administration with uh, a quasi deadline for getting out. And of course, the events that we saw a year ago, which I don't need to go into detail here. Uh, so I think that the dominant point I would make about the arc of American involvement in Afghanistan is that um, it was never very well planned and it was always carrying second place to another war in another desert, um, which uh, had nothing to do, of course, with the attack of September 11th, 2001. Let me finish there. Excellent, thank you, Bruce. Um, I'll turn uh, now to Vanda. Vanda, of course, you've done um, field work in Afghanistan. I, I wanted to bring you in on this larger question on the arc of the war. Um, uh, in particular, if you could comment on the nature of the Taliban insurgency over the years, uh, and then the, the negotiations at the end, uh, the, the, the peace process uh, and um, the sort of the end of the, of the war. Well, um, Bruce laid out uh, the two uh, thrusts of the effort, the counter-terrorism effort that was principally ge uh, geared toward Al-Qaeda and other terrorist group and the counterinsurgency effort. And the counterinsurgency effort was not only conflicted, it often was uh, directly in contradiction to the counter-terrorism effort, especially when a lot of the counter-terrorism objectives questioned whether there was any need to build an Afghan state that was effective and accountable, and uh, also then centered on embracing um, warlords, power brokers, uh, leaders in the Afghan security forces who were promising to deliver on the counterterrorism objectives by killing enough Taliban. You know, you ask us, uh, Madiha, to reflect on the sort of larger lessons. And in fact, the same problems why we lost, why the United States and the West lost and the Taliban won, we see repeated in uh, uh, counterinsurgency after counterinsurgency, whether this is Northern Nigeria, whether this is, Mal uh, whether this is Mali, whether this is Niger, whether this is uh, Mozambique, Somalia, I can go through uh, a whole set of them. The counterinsurgency was able at various times to clear, it was, uh, struggling always to hold. Uh, it uh, it uh, rarely had any effective uh, Afghan forces to whom it could hand off the whole portion, uh, and uh, it uh, struggled to build. Moreover, um, there is another problem that uh, spans all these conflicts, and in my view is the fundamental, the critical issue uh, that the United States and the West, and for that matter, other countries have not dissolved. What do you do if the local leadership, your local partner, um, is deeply corrupt, deeply disinterested, deeply, par uh, deeply parochial, interested in reaping short-term material benefits for one's clique, but not interested in governing that's accountable, that operates on some basis of fairness, and that is not discriminatory around uh, particular cliques. So all along, the, the fundamental issue was that the leadership and governance that the new Afghan Republic was putting forth was often deeply resented by Afghans. And the further you went out of Kabul, the more you felt the problems of this very parochial, very corrupt, very self-interested leadership. Uh, and governance that centered constantly on politicking rather than making policy, rather than governing. What do I mean by that? Uh, the engagement of Afghan uh, political elites uh, uh, became constantly to generate crises within the Republic to milk more payoffs from uh, the leadership 
uh, to reduce the crisis, to have more uh, personal benefits in terms of power and money for oneself and one set of um, uh, supporters. And this really characterized the entire 20 years of the efforts, the hope uh, that were there that uh, power would become more devolved, more accountable, wiser, more benevolent when the Ashoghani government uh, came in, uh, really never materialized. Meanwhile, the Taliban um, were brutal thugs, and they are still brutal thugs. They are a brutal authoritarian regime, uh, a dogmatic movement as they were in the 1990s. But nonetheless, uh, throughout the insurgency, they were capable of doing several things. They were um, uh, capable of delivering governance that was brutal but predictable, and uh, that people could develop coping mechanisms to. And often uh, throughout my many travels around Afghanistan and engaging with communities over the many years, uh, over the 20 years uh, that I went there almost on a yearly basis and sometimes more than once a year, uh, people would comment on the difficulty of negotiating life, dealing with uh, governors and district officials and power brokers linked with the Republic. And in contrast with uh, the brutality and repression that was very palpable from the Taliban, but they nonetheless delivered some predictable rules. Uh, and the Taliban excelled in other things like delivering um, immediate justice resolution. I uh, dispute resolution, I, I use the term justice here very carefully, but uh, mediating between disputes, certainly in a way that was not necessarily accountable and would not hold up uh, to Western standard, it's not something that we would want to live under, but nonetheless, again, provided uh, the capacity for local communities to, to move on uh, with their lives within a system of rules that was clear. Uh, what the Republic was constantly delivering was corruption, exclusion, um, uh, corruption to the point that this very same disputes would take um, uh, years and years to deliver. Uh, the Taliban didn't have to bribe, the Republic had to be bribed um, constantly. The second thing that the Taliban excelled, and you know, we have to sort of look at uh, insurgencies historically, and here is an insurgency that has been alive for 40 years that twice defeated a uh, major superpower, and that is back in the office. Now, we will come to about how long they'll stay in the office in the second part, but the, it, it's a remarkable insurgency. And so the second reason why they have been so effective, one was that they, number one was that they delivered governance that despite its horrors was often more tolerable or tolerable enough to local communities. The second element of that was that they could calibrate their brutality uh, in uh, response to pushback from local communities. So, for example, we through the past 20 years, we went through multiple instances when the Taliban would shut down girls schools as they did um, when they are back in power. And you saw local communities being able to react effectively uh, to the Taliban, engage the Taliban, engage in negotiations, and the Taliban would loosen the reins. They would never become rebels, they would never become Democrats, they would never embrace human rights and accountability, but they pull back from uh, brutality and oppression that was intolerable to local communities. The fourth uh, uh, reason why they have been so effective is because they have been able to shut down uh, um, um, uh, other opposition. Their biggest problem is the Islamic State in Khorasan, and uh, they are still a problem today. Uh, their struggle today with what uh, many other administrations in Afghanistan and the uh, Western counterinsurgency has struggled, namely dealing with urban cells uh, of, of uh, terrorists. But they were able to take away um, the uh, ISK's rural areas, and they did so repeatedly. They did so with other groups. They have been quite effective in neutralizing um, um, armed opposition to themselves. And fourth and finally, and with this, um, I'll uh, uh, hand it to uh, you and, and to Wes. Uh, the Taliban has really been remarkable in surviving leadership changes. Now, Bruce spoke about the amount of drone attacks that went into decimating Al-Qaeda. Uh, but the United States had a similar policy of uh, the so-called high-value targeting decapitation of the Taliban leadership that uh, was not just the Taliban leadership that became uh, very much defined as a very broad set of whoever Taliban leader was. Now, at various points, we were killing 
uh, Taliban commander of five men who was he was Taliban commander. The United States multiple times went through the middle level leadership, very low level leaders, quote unquote, um, as well as, of course, kill actors like Mullah Mansour, which in my view um, uh, was uh, one of the blunders um, uh, of um, uh, our uh, effort, at least at the tactical level. And all of this was done with the hope that if we decapitate enough of the leadership, the Taliban would collapse on itself. And so really since 2014, the United States and Western policy was essentially hoping that two things would happen, that the Taliban would make enough mistakes and it would shoot itself in the foot and under its, uh, undo itself, which the Taliban never did. And second, uh, that the Afghan leadership would somehow miraculously come to realize their completely counterproductive and misguided ways uh, would uh, 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 need to be changed or else it would collapse the moment the United States withdrew, whether this was uh, 2021 or whether this would be 2014. Great. Th thanks, Vanda. Um, I uh, forgot to mention at the top that um, if you have questions, please, um, to our audience, uh, send them along. Uh, you can email events at brookings.edu with your questions uh, or uh, on Twitter, uh, pose them uh, with the hashtag AfghanUS. Uh, and we'll come to those questions uh, towards the end of the discussion uh, in the last 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so Wes, uh, now I want to turn to you. Um, of course, I, you know, you described in, in such detail um, your experience as an embedded journalist, embedded reporter uh, in the, the Pesh Valley. Um, so I, I, want, I, I was wondering if you could, you know, again, reflect on this larger question um, of a retrospective and lessons learned, but also discuss with us how what you saw in the in the Pesh Valley about the military mission, how does that align with or not align with um, what we saw at the end in Afghanistan as a whole? So what how is that um, sort of the collapse of the Afghan army? Is that something you could have foreshadowed when you were, uh, you know, in that in that region um, uh, at the at the beginning of the surge uh, with with President Obama's surge? Um, how does you know the your experience in the Pesh um, sort of give a larger picture of the military mission in Afghanistan? Over to you. Sure. So um, the Pesh is a, a an area in northeastern Afghanistan that's very mountainous, very heavily forested. In some ways, very different from many other parts of Afghanistan. Um, but I chose to to focus on it and try to write, um, you know, not only about my limited experience in that valley, but about the, the the broad experience of the U.S. military and the CIA and the Joint Special Operations Command over many years in this valley. Um, because this place illustrates, um, you know, what Bruce and Vonda have been talking about, the dichotomy between counterterrorism on the one hand and counterinsurgency and nation building on the other. I mean, I very clearly remember uh, in 2010, my first time in the Pesh, um, being at this little outpost uh, and uh, the battalion commander there, a lieutenant colonel who had been there in the counterterrorism mission. Now he was there with the regular army in the in the counterinsurgency mission, and he would go on to return to this area in, in various roles, um, putting it very starkly to me in kind of an in brief in his office when I visited his unit um, in a way that I hadn't heard other commanders put it in, you know, many embeds with many different units. Um, he said, you know, I, I, he said, I read the same news as you do. Uh, and what we're doing here isn't very clear. Are we chasing terrorists or are we building a nation? It isn't very clear. Um, now, I think in part, uh, that was because the Pesh, unlike many other areas of Afghanistan, is a place where both the counterterrorism thread and the counterinsurgency thread were constantly represented throughout the 20 years of war. You know, there are many parts of Afghanistan where U.S. forces wound up facing off against local Taliban, um, fighting people who had never left their district uh, and, and never kind of saw the counterterrorism effort. In the Pesh, on the other hand, there always was a presence of Al Qaeda, sometimes a very low level presence, sometimes a more overt presence. Um, but really, the story arc there is uh, the United States goes in there for counterterrorism aims. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, Kunar province is where bin Laden uh, initially sought uh, safe haven after being driven out of Tora Bora in December 2001. Um, so the Joint Special Operations Command and the CIA go up to Kunar sort of trying to pick his trail back up, but they're always a couple steps behind him. Um, 
they then hand things over to the conventional military uh, and things snowball basically out of control. Uh, you, you see this phenomenon where outposts are built, uh, bases are built, missions are undertaken by one arm of the military, uh, you know, JSOC or the Green Berets or some special, you know, smaller special operations organization. Then they gradually hand things over to the conventional military without really explaining to them what the underlying logic had been for the decision in the first place. And over time, you see um, outposts and missions, uh, you know, road building projects, whatever it may be, um, take on logics of their own that are unmoored from the, the original the original logic that that put them there in the first place. Um, in in the course of this process, um, which you know goes up through the through the surge years in Afghanistan, uh, uh, what you really see is the U.S. military always puts training and advising and building up the Afghan military very much in the back seat. This is, it's never the primary effort of the mission. Um, you know, the US Army, it's sort of, it's very focused on defeating the Taliban insurgency, um, creating, you know, creating white spaces, they would say, uh, with US forces um, to, to, you know, to in theory protect the population so that these theoretical Afghan forces can come in and, and take over later. Um, but at, at every step along the way, building up those Afghan forces is kind of a, 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 an afterthought. Afghan forces are dragged along as auxiliaries to check a box. They're not, uh, they're not the main effort. And over time, what you see is, uh, you know, by the time the military realizes its error uh, in the post-surge era and starts to really devote more resources to advising and training, um, they've kind of spoiled the place. Um, the sort of a, a golden hour has passed. A lot of goodwill is gone. Um, and in, in places like the Pesh or like Helmand or the Argandab Valley in the South, places where really the fighting was at its most intense, uh, outposts that were built for the counterinsurgency purpose of uh, being kind of bubbles of security for the population instead become bubbles of insecurity, bubbles of danger. They draw in conflict. Uh, and the U.S. military over time gradually collapses in on these outposts until the point where it's kind of just, just defending itself. Um, you know, belatedly, uh, it, after U.S. forces have kind of washed their hands of some of these places, including the Pesh, uh, the Afghan army gets up and running. And this is what the third of four parts of, of my book um, is about, is sort of this, the, the period where the Afghan army gets on its feet in the Pesh, takes things over. Um, but it's, it's, it's crippled by um, the years that it has spent as just an auxiliary force to this large U.S. conventional presence. Um, so, you know, the, the Afghan army has been built in a sense not to fight on its own, um, but to fight as uh, auxiliaries for a U.S. and international presence that is completely reliant on air power, um, has very sophisticated and expensive logistics systems. Um, so then when, you know, when Afghan forces are kind of are left on their own, um, they just they're not able to cut it. Um, you know, they, they have been built to require systems that they will never have. Um, and then the, the story ends in the, you know, the fourth part of the book um, with kind of a return to counterterrorism. Um, as U.S. forces withdraw from the Pesh, uh, ironically, in the post-surge era, uh, Al-Qaeda in Pakistan at that very moment is under the heaviest pressure of its history from the CIA drone campaign. Um, and bin Laden, in his, in his letters before his death, um, identifies in discussion with Atiya Abdul Rahman, his operational chief, he identifies this area north of the Pesh Valley that U.S. forces have divested themselves of over after heavy losses um, as a potential future safe haven, a place to go um, if the CIA drone pressure in, in, you know, in Waziristan and the Fatah becomes too intense. And so this launches a, a period where the Joint Special Operations Command runs its own parallel drone campaign in the mountains north of the Pesh, trying to prevent this future safe haven from coming into existence. Um, and focusing on uh, sort of an heir to the Al-Qaeda enterprise in Afghanistan named Farouk al-Qahtani, who becomes a very serious, you know, focus for the Obama administration during its second term. Um, so uh, while the Afghan army is, you know, getting up and running um, in the Pesh on its own terms on the ground, um, the Joint Special Operations Command is, is hunting al-Qaeda and the Taliban from the air. Uh, and in this final period of the war, you again see kind of the dichotomy between the counterterrorism mission exemplified by JSOC's Operation Haymaker, the air campaign, uh, and the nation building mission uh, with Afghan forces on the ground, which again, you know, as has often been the case throughout the whole war effort, uh, can really be at odds. Um, the, the JSOC air campaign, for instance, um, you know, it's, it's, it can't, it, it focuses heavily at first on genuine Al Qaeda targets. But as it runs out of them and as they become better at operational security, it shifts to uh, 
hunting Taliban figures who are kind of ever more distantly related uh, to these Al Qaeda figures in order to make it harder for the Al Qaeda figures to, you know, to exist, to plan attacks, to have the kind of freedom of action that they would need um, to, to launch attacks overseas. And the JSOC campaign is successful at this goal. It drives the Al Qaeda guys farther and farther up into the hills. Um, but at the same time, uh, it, it also, uh, in some ways, undermines uh, the Afghan government um, because, you know, the, the drone campaign, it causes civilian casualties, albeit far fewer than earlier phases of the war. Um, but even when it doesn't cause civilian casualties, um, there are effects like, you know, sort of working your way through Taliban leadership. Uh, you know, you kill a district governor that a community had an understanding with. He's replaced by another district governor who is much harder for the community to work with and so on and so forth. Um, in a way that really builds resentment um, against uh, against the the, the U.S. backed Afghan government, um, you know, through no fault of the Afghan governments, even as at the same time, you know, down in the areas that the government controls, um, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's defeating itself in the ways that Vonda has described uh, through predatory behavior. Um, in, in the end, you wind up uh, with this. Uh, uh, kind of a dilemma for the for the US government where it's it, it faces two counterterrorism enemies al qaeda and the islamic state and it has to decide in the in the years and months before the doha agreement uh, which one it's going to focus on um, and it essentially makes the decision that the Islamic State, uh, the Islamic State in Afghanistan, is is the greater threat, and uses the Taliban as a, a proxy to to fight against it because the Taliban is fighting against the Islamic State, um, uh, and you wind up with this bizarre situation in the months before Doha, where even as the U.S. Uh, the U.S. military is pounding the Taliban with a you know tremendous air campaign everywhere else in the country, up in Kunar, it's actually tacitly supporting the Taliban against the Islamic State and kind of ignoring and taking its eye off the ball of of Al Qaeda, um, the Taliban's allies up there, um, and this is this is basically the situation that is you know in effect at the time of the the fall the fall of the government. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll leave it there. Thank, thanks, Wes. That was uh, that was great. Um, but, you know, yeah, could I just add yeah. one comment here? You know, you ask uh, Wes, um, was it uh, foreshadowed, or I would say less than foreshadowed? Was it quite obvious uh, in his book? Uh, and apart from his book, we, we had uh, um, a demonstration of how Afghanistan would, would go down. And this was uh, October 2015, when the province of Kunduz fell to the Taliban. It was the first time that the Taliban took a provincial capital. Uh, I was in Afghanistan at the time. I was up north, not in Kunduz. I was in the, another province. And I did what everyone else, all the Afghan elite did, was trying to bet, get back as fast as I could to Kabul. Uh, and why did uh, what happened in uh, Bahlan uh, foreshadowed, or, or not just foreshadowed, blatantly displayed all the problems of the Afghan security forces? Um, very poor unit leadership, um, corruption, ethnic divisions, um, a lot of abuse of Afghan soldiers um, by their leaders, uh, hence very limited morale great willingness to strike deals with the Taliban, something that was crucial for the collapse last year and the rapidity of the collapse. Um, the Taliban's capacity, not just to negotiate uh, deals and ceasefires with units, but also to neutralize what a lot of the counterinsurgency was uh, putting its stock in and hope. These various uh, auxiliary uh, forces, whether they were Afghan local police, the AP3, the AP uh, UFP, they were you know, searching different acronyms for local militias, uh, often being seen as the way to get out of the fact that by 2014, the Taliban was ascendant and slowly winning on the battlefield. And by the time we get to 2017, 2018, when I would be in Afghanistan, I started hearing with a lot of um, uh, frequency, if uh, arguably and at an anecdotal level, immense amounts of deal being done between the Afghan military and the Taliban, with units not uh, mounting operations against the Taliban, providing intelligence to the Taliban, making the judgment that the Taliban was going to win, or at least that it was not worth fighting the Taliban. So we had a preview of what would happen when the US withdrew. Um, no one uh, expected it would happen in the span of six weeks, uh, but we knew that the structure of the Republic was rotten. 
if I could jump in one more time here, I think there's another another good preview that I do describe in the book. It's not as consequential or as large scale as the fall of Kunduz. Um, but when U.S. forces withdrew from the Pesh Valley, literally a, a decade before uh, the collapse of Afghanistan in 2011, um, U.S. forces pulled out. They left an Afghan army battalion behind that was in no way prepared um, for, for what was to come. And rather than seeing you know, a collapse, uh, a mass attack on the bases of the Afghan uh, of the Afghan forces in the Pesh. What you do see is this deal making um, al almost immediately, um, and and this in fact draws U.S. forces back in uh, just later in the same year in 2011 um, because they fear that uh, the the unit left in the valley is going to basically sell its base. Uh, to the Taliban. They're listening in on signals intelligence. Um, there's a split within the Afghan army battalion between uh, one major who kind of wants to hang on and keep fighting and another major who is in touch with the Taliban and is trying to reach an accommodation with them. He probably wasn't actually trying to sell the base, but he was trying to reach an accommodation that would allow the unit to survive out there, um, uh, you know, allowing the Taliban greater and greater access to the valley. Um, so, you know, as with many things in Afghanistan, yeah, I think you can see things coming a long way ahead of time um, if you, you know, if you're willing to, if you're willing to look at them uh, and, and extrapolate them to a larger scale. But, uh, you know, the U.S. military solution um, in, in the Pesh in 2011 was uh, a misguided one. Um, it kind of, it, it returned to the valley and kept doing what it had been doing before, large air assault operations up into the hills to kill more Taliban. Uh, so, yeah. Great. Thank, thanks for that added perspective. Um, that's, that's really, really important. Um, you know, one thing that I just want to highlight, one thing that Bruce mentioned um, in, in his opening remarks uh, about the Taliban essentially out negotiating uh, the, the U.S. and, you know, underlying what, what all of you have mentioned, the, the U.S.-Taliban deal signed in Doha, um, you know, in my opinion, it was fatally flawed. It was a fatally flawed deal. Uh, it excluded the Afghan government, uh, uh, the then Afghan government, um, and didn't impose enough conditions on the Taliban. Um, and uh, you know, didn't make uh, the withdrawal conditional on any kind of power sharing agreement, which was uh, at that point the goal. Um, so we basically, you know, gave the Taliban an unconditional withdrawal and sort of uh, let them essentially uh, take over uh, the, the country. Um, I, I want to uh, turn now to sort of the situation in Afghanistan, in the region, uh, and it's, it's, uh, a grim situation in Afghanistan over the last year. Um, and before turning to, to Wanda um, uh, to describe sort of where we are today in Afghanistan uh, and sort of the Taliban's internal and external policies, um, and, you know, I just, I want to mention a, a, a few things. First, of course, uh, the rights of women's and, women and girls, uh, which have undeniably regressed, at least in the urban areas uh, in Afghanistan, which had seen gains. In the rural areas, you know, things had not changed uh, uh, very much over the last 20 years. But in urban areas, you know, you, you sort of see the segregation of uh, women and girls uh, from society. You see them uh, basically retreating from public life. And of course, all over the country, girls are not allowed to attend secondary school. Um, and, and we've seen protests, including uh, just over the, the weekend, um, but protests, you know, periodic protests from women and girls over that decision uh, from, the, from the Taliban. Um, uh, Afghanistan essentially has a non-functioning economy uh, because uh, it, uh, you know, the, the withdrawal uh, brought about an economic collapse with the drying up of aid, with sanctions imposed on the on the Taliban, with reserves frozen, and we'll come to this these decisions. Um, jobs dried up, uh, even for those who had jobs, uh, they're not receiving salaries because there's no liquidity in the economy because of that non-functioning uh, nature of the economy. This has precipitated a humanitarian disaster that was already in the works uh, because of a, a drought. Um, but at this point, you know, 19 million Afghans, half of the population essentially face food insecurity. You know, you have millions of mal malnourished children, um, hunger all around essentially in Afghanistan. Um, and finally, on, um, uh, on sort of special immigrant visas and Afghan allies, there are still tens of thousands um, who are waiting to uh, for evacuations, waiting to be evacuated. And, uh, you know, I want to highlight that even for those who have been evacuated, you know, life 
does not look the way they wanted it to because they struggle to find jobs and to adjust uh, in, in the US or in other areas where, where they are. Um, so that's sort of the way I see the picture and Vanda is going to speak more to this, of course, and uh, also um, discuss sort of the, the leadership of the, of the Taliban, the decision-making of the leadership. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we'll turn after this sort of round uh, to US policy and international policy towards the Taliban. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Valiha. I'll uh, go to it. I just want to add one comment on the people who have been evacuated. The other massive problem, of course, is that many people are still stuck in third countries. Um, you know, often this means living in a hotel you, uh, room in Paraguay or uh, Uganda um, as uh, the process of uh, clearing them and uh, getting them relocated to the United States or West has been excruciatingly slow. So uh, there is a lot of suffering um, in that domain as well. Of course, the suffering in Afghanistan is massive. Uh, you spoke about the uh, really bad uh, economic and humanitarian situation. There was significant fear last winter of uh, a massive famine uh, that was avoided, but there is much greater fear that we will hit uh, a big famine uh, this year because uh, people have depleted uh, their reserves, their capacity to adapt, or at least if they have not depleted it fully, uh, their, their reserve capacities are uh, just much lower. And as long as uh, uh, the legal situation remains such that um, liquidity cannot come to Afghanistan uh, because of uh, legal implications of uh, any aid going to the Taliban leaders, which are under sanctions and or supporting terrorism, which has to do with much broader set of um, laws against uh, terrorist financing and material support clauses, uh, we will constantly, and as long as the aid then centers on peanut butter, uh, penicillin, and blankets, we will be just lurching from one peak of a humanitarian crisis to another peak of humanitarian crisis. The Taliban leadership uh, rule so far has been authoritarian, dogmatic, and characterized by zealotry, and much more inward-looking uh, than... Um, um, could have been the case. And this has part to do with um, uh, the disposition of power within the Taliban, where power centers on the Amir, which is in this case, uh, Haibatullah uh, Akundaza, the man who replaced Mansur. Um, I mentioned that it was a blunder um, for us to kill Mansur because at the time, targeting was really based about any kind of Taliban leader um, should be taken out because this would weaken uh, the Taliban uh, leadership and the Taliban would then collapse on itself. The consequences of um, uh, killing Mansur were the much greater rise uh, of power of Sirajuddin Haqqani and his closeness to Pakistan and the ISI, um, and also the placement of um, Haibatullah Kundaza, whom the Taliban leadership had expected to be a weak leader, not threatening in power to either Mullah Yaqub or uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani. Alas, uh, the Taliban, like uh, the West, um, significantly miscalculated in whom they would end up with Akundaza and the set of sheikhs around him, like the prime minister who are ruling. And their rule really focuses on the afterlife. Um, the purpose of rule is to uh, bring in uh, a, a version of Sharia they believe is valid. Uh, that's one very narrow doctrinaire version of Sharia that is not replicated elsewhere in the world, very backward looking version of Sharia. And if that means that people are starving, so be it, Allah was its home. This is quite in contrast to uh, the rest of Taliban leadership that on the one hand includes the more internationally oriented people like um, uh, Baradar Stanekzai, as well as those uh, like Mullah Yaqub and uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who while authoritarian and with terrorist backgrounds, uh, nonetheless want to preserve rule uh, on earth and want to rule Afghanistan um, uh, for a significant amount of time to come. But this other leader, these other leaders have not been capable of influencing the decisions in, Kanha, in Kandahar on issue after issue after issue. So for example, the issue of girls schools is not popular within the Taliban. It is not demanded by many Taliban uh, leaders. In fact, there are both regular rank and file Taliban as well as uh, leadership Taliban 
who would like to see girls back in school, including their own daughters, but they don't dare challenge uh, at the current situation, uh, the Amir. So rules has been authoritarian, exclusionary. Uh, the repression of women has gone up significantly. Uh, the Ministry of Interior has often been focused on um, uh, internal um, purges, internal repression. The Taliban has been very effective in suppressing armed opposition with the one challenge, which is the Islamic State in Khorasan. But the National Resistance Front, for example, and several other small groups that have emerged remain feeble and don't hold any territories and do not pose uh, any threat to the Taliban, even if they mount very small attacks. And if they appear that there is um, a more of a threat coming, the Taliban puts it down. At the same time, uh, the Taliban has pulled back uh, from some of the uh, issues I mentioned were key to its success. It's reverted to more exclusionary rule, even within itself. It has marginalized ethnic Taliban commanders who were critical for the Taliban victory. Um, it has uh, really shrunk uh, decision-making and decision-making really consists of what uh, uh, the Amir and the clique around the Amir like Hassan want, uh, with uh, even inability to consult and put forth opinions uh, uh, from within the Taliban uh, to the leadership. So there is massive problem with how decisions are being conducted, communicated, internal accountability, let alone external accountability. And of course, the technical capacities um, are very limited. Let me just make a few comments about the counterterrorism picture, and then I'll hand it to uh, Bruce, which is that um, uh, both this internal rule and responses to the terrorist fighters who have been uh, flocking to Afghanistan, from Pakistan, the Gulf, Syria, Uyghur fighters uh, are there, are driven by the most significant axis on which the Taliban makes decisions to prevent defections and internal fragmentation. And the interpretation from Kandahar is that the way to avoid defection is to be as rigid, dogmatic, restrictive, as doctrinaire as possible. Now, that might be fundamental miscalculation, but this is what has been driving policy. One effect of that is not to challenge uh, foreign fighters uh, that are coming in, uh, also not to jeopardize foreign funding um, for, uh, for foreign fighters, and hence hubris and extraordinarily bad decisions like having Zawahiri in Sarajuddin Haqqani's um, safe house. So on the counterterrorism front, the most we can expect from the Taliban, and that's still to be seen, is not that they will neutralize uh, the foreign groups operating out of uh, operating in Afghanistan, but that perhaps they will not allow attacks out of Afghanistan to take place, which is the wording they have been using steadily. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Wanda. Um, Bruce, uh, I, I'd like to turn to you now on um, on this issue, sort of, you know, uh, where we are in Afghanistan, but uh, to broaden it out, the, the regional implications of the withdrawal um, and the regional winners and losers, if you will. Certainly. Um, the withdrawal was a uh, really strategic shift. Uh, for 20 years, America had made Afghanistan its principal objective in Central and South Asia, and now the Americans are gone. Um, there are many losers from this. Uh, I'm not even sure there is even one winner, but I will try to identify one winner. Let me start with the losers. First of all, Iran. As I mentioned earlier, Iran was in many ways America's partner in trying to uh, develop the government of Afghanistan. Uh, neither Tehran nor Washington ever wanted to talk about it in those terms. But in fact, on the ground, that is what was going on. Uh, Iran has a long history of hostility towards the Taliban. They almost went to war with each other back in the 1990s. Um, and I think that the Iranians have every reason to expect that the Taliban government on their um, eastern border is going to be a long-term problem for them. Already, the Taliban have resorted to a tactic that they've used for years, which is extreme violence against the um, Shia minority, uh, the Hazaris in Afghanistan. Uh, these minorities have long been 
um, protégés of the Iranian government. Uh, and this is a very source of uh, very great unease uh, in Tehran. Um, second loser, India. India was another major partner in trying to support the government of Afghanistan, gave considerable aid to the government of Afghanistan. Uh, for geopolitical reasons, the United States never wanted India to have boots on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, but the, certainly it had political boots, it had intelligence boots on the ground. Uh, those organizations in India who were deeply involved like the Indian Intelligence Service are now very, very worried about what's going to happen next. Uh, they know that there are very strong connections between the Taliban and anti-Indian groups, particularly lashkar e taiba the group that attacked Mumbai in 2008. Um, as uh, um, Vanda suggested, the, 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 the most the Indians are hoping for is that lashkar e taiba will not be allowed to stage attacks against India directly from Afghan territory, uh, but they don't even think that that's uh, likely to be what the Taliban does. Um, certainly the Taliban is not going to put lashkar e taiba and other groups under any kind of control. Uh, they're really uh, now finding that uh, these groups um, are building new sanctuaries, new safe havens uh, across Afghanistan uh, and very much concerned about what this will mean in the long term. India, of course, has no military option to deal with this problem because Pakistan stands between it and Afghanistan, and it certainly doesn't want to use any military options. The Iranians have some limited military options because they have a border, but India does not. And third, a, a loser who's not necessarily a regional player per se is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, when the United States first went into Afghanistan in 2001, uh, the Department of Defense made it very clear it didn't want allies to have boots on the ground there, and it resisted uh, any kind of international stabilization force. As time went on, that attitude changed completely. And by the second term of the Bush administration, getting NATO into Afghanistan was a big priority, particularly as it was obvious that NATO was not going to support us in Iraq. At least maybe we could get some help in Afghanistan. We were remarkably successful in doing so. And many NATO partners came in, worked very hard, Germany, for example, Sweden, others. Um, some lost interest, but most stayed in. And when the withdrawal came, many of these partners were very, very angered that they were not consulted, uh, that they were essentially told to get on an airplane and get out uh, without being tried, any effort made to try to preserve what they had built over the years. Uh, Afghanistan was NATO's first so-called out of area, meaning not European operation. And I think it's safe to say that Afghanistan will be NATO's last out of area operation. The one winner I would identify is Pakistan. Um, it certainly is a winner, but I would also say it's a very problematic victory. Uh, and I'll come to the problems in a minute. Uh, Pakistan, as we've all alluded to over the course of the last hour, uh, has been the Taliban's ally uh, for 30 years, if not longer. Um, it provided the uh, Taliban with sanctuaries and safe havens uh, from America. Uh, it assisted in training, assisted in strategy development, um, and assisted in fundraising. Uh, all of this was done by the uh, Pakistani Intelligence Service, the Inter Services Intelligence Directorate, ISI, uh, and by the Pakistani military uh, high command. The civilian leadership uh, of Pakistan was not all that involved in this, but certainly made no effort to prevent it or to halt it. Um, this relationship was especially close with the Haqqani network that um, uh, Vanda has been talking about uh, previously. So the victory of the Taliban is a sense, a victory of the ISI and the Pakistan army, very much like their victory over the Soviet Union in the 19, late 1980s. But it's troublesome, just as that earlier victim victory was very troublesome. Uh, first of all, Pakistan now uh, takes on some responsibility for what to do about governing Afghanistan. Uh, but it has very limited means to do anything about that. It takes on some responsibility for the economic catastrophe that's going on in Afghanistan. But again, it has very limited capacity to do anything about that. 
Most importantly, the Taliban have close ties to some very problematic actors in the Pakistan Taliban. Uh, and we are already seeing an increase in extremism on the Pakistani side of the border as a direct consequence of the Taliban's victory uh, in uh, Kabul. The issue has been somewhat overshadowed for the last year by Pakistan's own very serious problems. Uh, first, the downfall of the Imran Khan government and his emergence as a force of opposition to Shabazz Sharif and mass demonstrations and all of that. Uh, and then second, the climate disaster that has struck Pakistan uh, this summer, uh, probably a, one of the most uh, serious forewarnings of what the rest of us are going to see is happening in Pakistan today. So Afghanistan, the Taliban have all been on the back burner in Islamabad and Rawalpindi, uh, but these problems are not going to go away and how Pakistan deals with Afghanistan over the long term uh, is, is very difficult to say. I will identify in closing one other point. Um, I think there is a direct line between the withdrawal of NATO and America, America withdrawing and taking NATO with it uh, in August of last year and the Russian decision to invade the Ukraine. Because I think the Russian leadership came to the conclusion that the NATO organization had been severely weakened by what happened um, in Afghanistan. In retrospect, we can see that like on so many other points, the Russian leadership was uh, deluded, made a mistake. Um, so much of their intelligence seems to have been very, very poor and their intelligence about NATO's capacity to rebound once it was faced by an in-area, very serious act of aggression um, was a big mistake by the Putin government. So let me finish there. Great, thank you. Um, I, I will just add one quick point um, on sort of Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban, which has seen sort of fissures emerge, although they've tried to paper them over over the last year. Um, uh, you know, including over the the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and so on. But but as you mentioned, Bruce, you know, especially over the last few months, and in particular uh, over the last last month, you know, Pakistan's attention really is elsewhere uh, and focused on uh, the the climate disaster uh, in, in terms of flooding that it's dealing with uh, and the humanitarian crisis uh, within, within its borders now. Um, so I, I want to turn now to US policy uh, and we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to start weaving in audience questions on this as well, US policy towards the, the Taliban over the last year and going forward, you know, what are the options here? Um, and just by way of opening, I will say that, you know, what we were sort of told, um, uh, or, you know, at the point of the withdrawal, uh, that, that we had economic leverage over the Taliban and that we could use this economic le leverage, you know, the cutting off of aid, uh, the imposition of sanctions as the tool to try to get the Taliban to moderate does not seem to have worked. Uh, as Vanda outlined, you know, the, the Taliban has not moderated, you know, sort of still authoritarian, dogmatic, uh, and, and uh, you know, decision-making uh, being driven um, uh, basically by uh, Hebatullah Khunzada. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I want to sort of uh, weave in one audience question here, which um, came in uh, a few days ago, um, how can one promote economic development without supporting the Taliban? Essentially, you know, what, um, how can U.S. policy sort of deal with the situation as it is, as we've laid out? Um, and, you know, this question of whether uh, sort of in particular economic policy is, is just hurting the Taliban or is it or hurting the Afghan people? You know, what are the options? And is this, a sustainable equilibrium. You know, the U.S. is the largest provider of humanitarian aid uh, to Afghanistan. The U.N. Uh, launched its largest ever appeal for any single country um, in, uh, and, and, you know, in March this year, uh, collected over $2 billion for Afghanistan. That has largely staved off the worst of the humanitarian crisis. But humanitarian aid is just a band-aid. 
what is sort of long-term strategy towards the Taliban, towards Afghanistan, that um, the, the West and the US in particular can follow. Um, and I'm going to go to Vanda first, then Wes, then Bruce uh, on this. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we even one audience question at the end. Well, um, I think that we sort of misplace uh, our focus on how to deal with the economic and humanitarian situations by focusing on does this help or hurt the Taliban. Um, to some extent, that's inevitable because U.S. and international counterterrorism financing laws, as well as the sanctions on Taliban leadership, demand that legally no aid or material support can go to sanctions and designated entities. Uh, that has repercussions, not just for international aid, uh, that has uh, such as the reserves that are being held in the United States, that has also uh, significant repercussions for uh, investors, um, uh, private investors, private financial banks, who fear that if they allow money to come in in some form, uh, then uh, they will be uh, charged at some point, perhaps in the next administrations, or by uh, a, a private group of citizens, they will be charged with uh, supporting, um, uh, violating counterterrorism laws, which carries very, very significant repercussions. So there is this tremendous legal bind that is really limiting uh, how uh, aid can be delivered to the country. And that's very emblematic of the legal bind that the post 9-11 counterterrorism regime created. We see on a smaller scale, same problem in country after country after country that's struggling with terrorism. Back away from the legal issue, um, there is the sort of political dimension. The reality is that there is no way to escape from the fact that uh, if less fewer people are dying out of starvation, uh, there is probably less resentment against the Taliban. That, however, should, in my view, should not imply in any way that we should not be trying to save people from dying from starvation. There is a humanitarian aid coming in, that humanitarian aid needs to go around the Taliban and uh, NGOs who are operating on the ground, who are doing a really heroic job, have these strict rules of engagement within which they can operate to, to stay uh, in context, uh, uh, to stay in compliance rather with the um, counterterrorism um, context. However, those who say that there should be denial of aid, whether humanitarian or development, that can be made legal, I would counter that uh, the preventing that aid coming in doesn't bring regimes under. We have many examples of regimes like the Maduro regime, like the Mugabe regime, like North Korea, like Iran, facing very severe economic sanctions that tank the economy, and yet uh, the regime can, can crumble on. So while compliance with the legal requirements and the counterterrorism material financing laws uh, is essential and a big bind on policy, uh, the hope that deprivation will topple the uh, Taliban regime is, in my view, fully misguided. People who are starving do not rebel. Wes, over to you on this question of policy towards the Taliban, um, you know, economic or otherwise. Uh, on the economic question, I'm going to defer to Bruce and Vonda. It's not my area. Um, on the on the counterterrorism issue, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the question going forward is how effective can U.S. counterterrorism operations be at locating and striking Al Qaeda? Um, we saw obviously the Zawakri operation this summer uh, seemed to provide a promising indicator that the United States can find and uh, and and strike Al Qaeda targets. Um, but as Vanda alluded to earlier, I mean, I think how much of that was a U.S. intelligence success? How much of that was you know the, the result of a very bad miscalculation on the part of uh, the Taliban uh, and Al Qaeda that may not be replicated? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the United States ha put a lot of planning into um, what its counterterrorism options would look like in a post-US military Afghanistan, but all of those options uh, were predicated on the idea that there would still be a friendly government in power, uh, that there would be you know, surrogate forces uh, within the Afghan military that would continue to gather intelligence about Al-Qaeda as they fought the Taliban on the battlefield. 
Um, you know, some elements of those surrogate forces still exist uh, within the National Resistance Front. Um, how effective they are uh, outside of their, you know, their limited, very limited area of influence in the North, um, I think is a big open question, um, as is, you know, whether Al-Qaeda will learn from uh, it's it's mistake uh, this past summer in allowing Zawahiri to uh, you know exist almost in the open um, in in Kabul uh, and you know re up its operational security measures uh, return to tried and true tactics that made it so hard to find um, during the many years made its leaders so hard to find during the many years preceding Zawahiri strike um, you know I, I think we'll we'll have to see. Um, and, and those will be some of the factors that will underpin, you know, how whether the United States prosecutes further counterterrorism operations of the kind that it did uh, in, inside Afghanistan this summer. Bruce, over to you. Um, I would defer to Vanda on the business of uh, economic assistance. I think she summed it up quite well. Um, what is striking to me is that a year after the withdrawal, uh, we have so little American interest in the entire region, uh, very little American leadership in the entire region. We at least meet with the Taliban uh, in Doha from time to time. Uh, we have virtually no engagement with the government of Pakistan. Uh, President Biden never spoke to Imran Khan when he was prime minister, uh, and he hasn't spoken to Shabazz Sharif either. Um, it's particularly striking at a moment when Pakistan is undergoing a climate disaster of unprecedented proportions, and the president of the United States doesn't call the prime minister of Pakistan, a president who calls himself uh, a climate believer uh, and who wants to do something about climate, has even set up a, a, a minister of climate affairs, in effect, with, with John Kerry, and yet we're doing very little engagement with uh, Pakistan. As you have written about Medea, uh, this is, a, is really um, baffling. Um, why aren't we engaging uh, with the Pakistani government, not just on climate change, but on the whole question of Afghanistan? Uh, the, you know, the principal conclusion of my so-called AFPAC report, and I did not come up with the name AFPAC, uh, someone else did, um, was that you can't deal with the question of Afghanistan without engaging at the highest level with the government of Pakistan over a sustained period of time. Uh, in his uh, first volume of his memoirs, uh, Barack Obama makes that point very, very clear. And yet here we are uh, in 2022, uh, not engaging with Pakistan, not just on Afghanistan, but on virtually every issue in the region. Uh, it's a strategic blunder that I think is quite unfortunate uh, and which will sooner or later have uh, very serious consequences. It's not too late. Uh, I'm sure the Shabazz Sharif government would be very eager to engage with the United States. Uh, with the General Assembly coming up next month, we have the perfect opportunity to uh, uh, get Shabazz to Washington um, uh, as well as New York. Uh, and I would hope the administration would seize this opportunity uh, in order to begin a high level dialogue uh, with Islamabad. Yes, uh, Bruce, as you mentioned, you know, there hasn't been any engagement uh, from the, the White House, uh, or, you know, since uh, President Biden came into power. Um, but just over the weekend, um, uh, USAID administrator uh, Samantha Power was in, in Pakistan, uh, and the U.S. has um, uh, given uh, 50 million uh, dollars in aid uh, for for flood affectees. But but I think this is uh, this, this does require, uh, you know, uh, I think more resources as well as a higher level engagement. Um, uh, on on the you know on the question of uh, sort of um, economics and 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 engaging um, with uh, with the with the Taliban on um, you know the, the unfreezing of reserves. Uh, you know, I think uh, just one thing I'll mention, and Vanda has addressed this um, in more detail, just one thing I'll mention is, um, you know, when there is a question of creative solutions to try to use the reserves to insert some liquidity into the Afghan economy without benefiting the Taliban directly, um, 
every time there are sort of discussions that are being had with the US government and other governments on this question uh, with the Taliban, you know, something or the other comes up uh, in terms of Taliban decision making that kind of um, halts the process or stalls it. You know, last month it was Zawahiri being found in, in Kabul, being killed in Kabul, you know, and, and sort of it makes it politically infeasible for the, the U.S. really to do do more. Um, you know, uh, six months ago, it was the decision on girls schooling. Um, but but I'll stop there on that. Uh, we have about five minutes left. There are two questions, that, uh, you know, that we received from the audience that I want to bring up here um, and whoever uh, can jump in or wants to jump in on responses just you know for a minute or two uh, that would be great so the first is kind of a, a larger picture question which is how likely is it that lessons learned from Afghanistan will be relevant to future conflicts the U.S. engages in given how different the circumstances may be um, you know uh, how the sort of the applicable applicability of, of lessons learned? That's sort of the, the first question. And then uh, the second question um, comes, uh, that's a more specific question about how the panelists view the recent uh, Islamic State Khorasan uh, ISKP claimed attack on the Russian embassy in Kabul last week. Um, this is the first attack on a diplomatic mission since the Taliban's takeover. Uh, what does this mean? What does this portend? Um, so over to whoever wants to jump in on those questions over the next couple of minutes. Uh, I'll jump in on the first one briefly. Um, I think it's it's easy, and the United States military may fall prey to this uh, tendency um, to look at Afghanistan and then look at Ukraine uh, and think, well, we're in a whole new era of warfare, you know, back to high intensity conflict, something like that. But that would to do that would lose sight of the fact that in many cases the future conflicts the United States will be involved in are the current conflicts that the United States remains involved in, in Somalia, in Yemen, in Syria, um, in the Sahel, um, where I think the lessons of Afghanistan remain very, very relevant. Um, you know, US forces have gone back into Somalia after briefly departing. Um, and, you know, you can see uh, over the past five years in Somalia, very often uh, situations where the lessons of the early years of Afghanistan uh, would be relevant, you know, about uh, not allowing yourself to be, you know, played as a proxy by your own proxies, um, used uh, in situations where, you know, U.S. forces or airstrikes are are being used to settle disputes, uh, your, your intelligence is being misrepresented to you, um, and the broader lessons about security assistance. I mean, I, I think one of the lessons of Afghanistan for the U.S. military um, is that it uh, leaned far too heavily on uh, building an ar armies in its own image, uh, in, 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 you know, in ways that I've discussed earlier, but also in the way um, where the U.S. military focused very heavily in Afghanistan on creating a constellation of, of elite special operations units um, that in many ways sucked away talent and resources uh, from the larger conventional force, making it you know, brittle and susceptible to the kind of collapse that we saw over the past few years and especially last year. You see the same tendency almost everywhere that the United States um, is engaged in, in security assistance and advising. You see it in Somalia, uh, where U U.S. forces are so heavily invested in the Danab Special Operations Brigade, um, but largely disengaged from the larger Somali National Army. Um, so I think I would bear in mind the degree to which future conflicts are the conflicts that the United States still remains engaged in, in low-intensity wars in, in Africa and the Middle East. I wouldn't reiterate what uh, I had said earlier and that directly connects with uh, Wes's comments, namely that um, the same reasons why we lost in Afghanistan are reasons why counterinsurgent forces, whether they are the Wagner Group, whether they are a combination of Western support uh, or SADC and Rwandan forces are struggling in Mozambique, Somalia, Niger, Mali, um, you know, take your pick across the region. Um, there is fundamental lack of alignment between the objectives of Western counter, uh, counterinsurgency assistant and the objectives of local elite, local partner governments, who often do not want to have the conflict ended. They certainly don't want to have the conflict ended if that would require that their change, their parochial, corrupt, rapacious, predatory, exclusionary ways and move to rule that is beyond their clique, that is more about accountability and more about sharing access to resources. As long as there's an external intervener, 
that suppresses conflict enough that it doesn't pose problems to the capital, and they can continue with that mafia-like rule, they are perfectly comfortable. Uh, comfortable. And there is no one yet, uh, whether it's the new Chinese ambition to be uh, intersecting, uh, to be uh, putting itself forward uh, as uh, the negotiator and mediator in these African conflicts, whether it is the Wagner Group with its fin pretense to be doing anything other than securing strategic uh, and resource access to Russia, or um, the much more accountable, much more governance focused Western efforts, uh, we haven't resolved that. One comment on the Russian attack. Some people have been suggesting that this is a game changer in Afghanistan. I do not believe so. There are many Afghan diaspora who are asking me constantly if there is a hit on the Western embassy in Central Asia, will the United States reinvade and uh, topple the Taliban? And I repeat, you need to have a different plan. I'll be very brief, Medea, uh, as uh, Bobby Gates, who spent a lot of time working on the Afghanistan problem, uh, said about uh, the lesson he learned from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, that in the future, if any uh, future Secretary of Defense ever recommends to a president engaging in a ground war in Asia, that Secretary of Defense should have his head examined. Uh, this is not something that is easy, and this is not something that we have done well. From Vietnam to Afghanistan, this has been a legacy of failure. Let's not engage in any more out of area missions with large ground forces uh, on the Asian um, or African continents. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Wes. Thank you, Wanda. Um, you know, for an excellent, nuanced, sobering conversation. Um, and there will be more conversations on Afghanistan, in particular focusing on the economic crisis, um, focusing on women's rights and uh, girls' education, et cetera, going forward. Uh, but uh, today, I want to thank our excellent panel, um, Wes, Vanda, Bruce, um, on behalf of uh, the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings and the Center for Middle East Policy. And thank you for, to our audience for sending in excellent questions. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us.